I would like to extend a very special welcome this evening to our speakers, Gemma Reid and Kenneth Wood. I'll give you more details on them in a few minutes. Um, this is the first Heritage Evening since the very sad passing of our much-loved and former Heritage Evening Chairman, um, Canon John McKegney. We would like to remember John in a positive way, and I would call on our Vice Chairman, John Murr, to introduce this short tribute to a wonderful man. Good evening. <clears throat> Canon John McKegney, who was well known to many of you personally, and was known to the wider membership through his chairing of the Heritage Evening in recent years, passed away in the early hours of the 22nd of September this year, surrounded by his family. John was a long-time member of Portrush Heritage Group and served as both a member of committee and later as a director. John was not a native of Portrush, but was a regular visitor, both as a child and later in his adult years, before moving here in his retirement. He was a keen historian, an ardent steam railway enthusiast, and a railway modeler. He was a gentleman in every sense of that word, but he could be a forceful chairman when required as was evidenced by the occasion when he had to step in and separate an over-enthusiastic speaker from this podium, which he did politely but firmly. He made an important contribution to the work of Portrush Heritage Group as a member, as a director and as a volunteer at events, notably at Pirates of Portrush, where he was both a photographer and a steward. His wise counsel at meetings, developed from many years of experience on committees and through his vocation as a rector and canon in the Church of Ireland, kept his fellow directors <coughs> pardon me, on the straight and narrow and prevented us adopting some more radical and outlandish proposals and ideas. He was possessed of a calm, humorous and sensible approach to life and this was apparent to any of us who interacted with him. He was knowledgeable and practical. He was a pleasure to be with at all times and will be very, very greatly missed by his fellow directors. His passing is a loss to Portrush Heritage Group, but more so to his family and friends to whom we extend our heartfelt condolences. Our tribute to John McKegney this evening takes the form of a showcase video that he made in December 2020, recalling a Sunday school excursion from his home city of Londonderry to Portrush. He wrote this work himself and he provided many of the photographs which accompany it. Thank you. I'm John McKegney and although I've only recently retired to Portrush, Portrush has been part of my life as long as I can remember. Because like many children in the towns and cities of Northern Ireland, from the mid-19th century up until the 1960s, there were two great annual corporate events. Both were preceded by great expectations. One was Christmas and the arrival of Santa, Turkey and Carols. But the other was the annual Sunday school excursion by steam train to Portrush. For many of the less fortunate, it might be their only day by the seaside all year. Indeed, their only escape from grim, cramped houses and drab streets. Churches across the country organised these outings by booking trains to the coastal resorts for their Sunday school scholars who received free train and refreshment tickets, while their parents, family and friends, as well as the public at large, could buy tickets to travel in the trains at a greatly reduced cost. The refreshment tickets had two tear-off strips, one for a morning refreshment, the other for an afternoon one. Both consisted of bags of sandwiches, white bread, a Paris bun and some sort of little cake. Caterers supplied copious quantities of tea from large teapots containing ready-milked and sugared tea. 
In our case, Barry's generously provided a field behind their arcade for taking the meals. There were sheds for tea boiling and shelter, for in those days it sometimes rained in Portrush. To access the field, it was necessary to pass the delights and distractions of Barry's, which in my earlier days included monkeys to feed and crazy mirrors in which we could laugh at our distorted selves. All good fun, though perhaps not for the monkeys. The anticipation as the day approached grew, but there were important decisions to be made in advance, and perhaps the greatest of these involved boats. Two double choices faced little boys like me. Should my mother buy me a boat in Woolworths and Derry before the big day, or wait until we got to Port Rush and avail of the much greater selection and offer in the White House? Toys were along the left-hand side where the menswear is today. The trouble was that going shopping in the White House used up valuable playing time for sailing the chosen vessel in the paddling pool at the Arcadia. But that was not the only dilemma to be addressed. Was the boat to be a sailing boat or a clockwork one? Each had its appeal. The clockwork ones tended not to last too long when the seawater got into their mechanisms, whereas there was nothing to go wrong with the sailing boats. The snag was you didn't know where they would go in the pool. It wasn't easy being an excited little boy in the 50s. When the day arrived, we bundled into the car to meet our friends at the waterside station, and in later years, tried to bag an adult-free compartment in the non-corridor coaches. Coaches, it must be admitted, that had seen better times. There were two long trains in waterside station. The slightly shorter one was for Methodists, and it was in the right-hand platform. Ours was for St. Augustine's Church of Ireland and First Derry Presbyterian. It was so long that on some occasions part of it used the second platform after the Methodists had departed, the two sections being coupled together before departure. Such shunting would be a definite no-no today. Excitement mounted and a close eye was kept on the weather. On one memorable occasion, it was pouring on one side of the train, but dry on the other. Sadly, the meteorological front moved too wet on both sides as we departed. As the powerful Jeep 264 tank locomotive whistled for departure and started to move, a cheer went up as we enjoyed seeing the town we loved so well drift away across the foil. The first stop was at Limavady Junction to pass a regular train. But on one occasion there were Derry and Belfast bound trains wanting to pass at the junction. So our non-priority excursion train had to head off up the stump of the old Limavady branch. There we had a great view of the two express trains heading off in opposite directions before we backed out of the branch onto the main line before heading on to our next stop at Castle Rock. Downhill Beach was a curtain raiser for what lay ahead in Port Rush, and then we were plunged into the darkness of two tunnels. Those tunnels would prove particularly useful on the way home for teenagers. If you had met someone and you weren't sure about how they felt about you before you entered the tunnels, you knew one way or another before you emerged. It was great fun. After Castle Rock, it was on to Coleraine but there there was a lifting bridge to be crossed first. One year we were excited. The bridge had been lifted to let a ship through, so the train had to stop. In due course the lifting part went down and the train could go on. The engine puffed and panted. A column of smoke shot up into the air. The wheels went round and round, but the long heavy train simply wouldn't move. What was going to happen? Simple. We started off in reverse and went back a mile or two and took a run at it. Different times. That got us into Coleraine, where other trains from lesser places like Carrickfergus or Belfast were also waiting to go to the port. 
No problem for them. They could just go straight on to the Portrush branch. But our engine had to uncouple and run round the train. This was done with great efficiency and soon it was ready to pull us along the branch. Some younger children were worried as we set it all, as it set off in the reverse direction in case it was going to take us back to Derry. Thankfully, the UTA in this instance knew what it was doing and we need not have worried as we headed down the branch. The great thrill was the glimpse of the sea at Juniper Hill and then the expansive view of Sandhills Beach and the sea of the West Strand, now glistening in glorious sunshine as we rolled down the embankment into Portrush Station. I remember the shock I experienced as we arrived one year to find that Portrush Station had lost its great wooden roof. It just looked so bare. We all piled out of the train. I pestered my mother for a penny to print my name on a strip of metal on the big red machine. But her response was, we'll see, maybe later, as we headed down the side steps straight into Barry's and out to the back for their first refreshments of the day. In Barry's there seemed to be something new every year, but the racers, the dodgems, or bumpers as we called them, and the ghost trains were staple attractions, along with the laughing sailor and the haunted house machines. Outside there was the Peter Pan Railway beside the packed bus station. I was saddened when this wee railway was cut back to allow a car track to be built. A retrogressive move as far as I was concerned. But first there was food to be consumed, so it was out to the back of Barry's. One year I asked my brother if he could have his Paris bun, as he didn't seem to want it. But as I reached, as I reached for it, he grabbed it and held it aloft to keep it from my hands. As I asked him again, more or less nicely, the matter was settled when a seagull swooped down and took the whole bun out of his hand. My mother said, let that be a lesson to both of you. It was. I now keep a wary eye on seagulls when I have food. Anyway, after the refreshments, it was out to sample the delights of Port Rush. But there simply wasn't time to sail the boat at the Arcadia paddling pool, eat a huge candy floss, go for a swim on the raft in the harbour, build a few sandcastles, fish in the rock pools at the East Strand, go for a cruise around the skerries on the ambitiously named Queen Elizabeth II, and to use my carefully saved money back in Barry's. In later years, as girls began to come an attraction rather than an irritation, the ghost train and the sand hills took on a whole new role. And in any case, I needed company for the Castle Rock tunnels. Such memories come flooding back. Sometimes it rained, though mostly my memory is of sunshine. But I still recall the pleasure of being safe in the shelter at East Strand from a downpour. Its glass bricks fascinated me. Rain or sun, wind or calm, soon too soon, it was time to make our way back to the magnificent black and white timber station, to be told annually by my father about the toast rack tram that used to run to the Giant's Causeway from beside it. He told me it closed the year I was born, as though that was cause and effect. The station was packed with happy but tired people, waiting their turn to board the train. Once again, the Derry Methodist train left before us, though some people had a longer day travelling to Port Rush as a Methodist and returning as Church of Ireland or Presbyterian, depending on what part of the train they were in. The station featured a huge departure board with train times and destinations, neatly written in chalk. It was an intriguing guide to assorted parish and Presbyterian churches, gospel halls, meeting houses and assemblies from all over the province. As the train pulled up the bank to Javaran and on to Coleraine, we knew we had a great day out and we still had the Castle Rock tunnels to enjoy 
in age-appropriate ways. Even though as a family we'd soon be heading off on our summer holidays, no day would be quite as special as that of the Sunday School excursion to Port Rush. Our first speaker this evening is Gemma Reid. Gemma, you will know, as the driving force behind the annual SWELL event. SWELL is a volunteer-led community festival by and for Port Rush. It celebrates creativity and entrepreneurial spirit of our small coastal community and the well-being benefits of engaging with our local culture, arts and environment. We are delighted to have the opportunity to be part of the community groups working along with Gemma on SWELL. Gemma has a BA in Fine Art and Applied Art and an MA Honours in Museum Studies from the University of Southampton. Gemma is a heritage practitioner who engages people in exploring place and identity in the past. She has worked alongside Dr Colin Breen during the excavation of the early 17th century town built by Randall MacDonald at Dunluce, utilising that opportunity to open dialogue in local communities about the legacies of plantation. She will describe the pro that process and its impact for participants and outline how the excavation changed our understanding of the history and significance of Dunluce Castle in the present. Gemma's talk tonight is called Dunluce and the Legacies of Plantation. Thank you very much, Jade. I'm very pleased to be here. It's really nice to see quite a few familiar faces in the audience. So thank you, John, for volunteering me to do this. <laughs> it's not often that I do speeches like this, so bear with me. I'm not going to keep you for too long either. Um, you all know Dunluce. It's one of our most iconic and most visited um, archaeological monuments. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to be an authority on the history or archaeology of Dunluce Castle because I'm not a historian and I'm not an archaeologist. But as Jade said, I worked alongside the archaeologists, particularly Dr Colin Breen, um, in the period of excavation of Dunluce Castle, which was the first time that it had been properly investigated and excavated by um, archaeologists. Um, and that was while I was working with the council in the museum service as their community engagement officer and um, we were working on a peace programme. And so this um, project was specifically designed to challenge people's thinking and get them talking about how we regard the past in the present. So that's really what I'm going to concentrate on today. Um, just out of curiosity, who of you have already heard Colin Breen talk about Dunluce Castle? <laughs> a couple. Oh, a couple. All right, I expected there to be more. Great. So then I'll not bore you too much with some of the details. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. And the next one, actually. Um, the place element done from Dunluce means fort, obviously, in Irish. And that suggests that there is a, was a fortification on this promontory for at least 1,500 years. But much of the standing architecture, which is laid out in this plan that you'd see in the visitor guides at the castle, dates to the first decades of the 17th century when Randall MacDonnell, who became the first Earl of Antrim, was in charge at the castle and made significant developments at the site. The next slide, please. But some of the upstanding structures date back earlier than that um, to the 15th, late 15th and early 16th centuries when the Maquillans um, held the site as the centre of their Irish and Gaelic lordship. Um, so the remaining corner towers, um, that's one of them on the left, um, which are at the northeast and southeast of the site, date to this period. And I was instructed by an archaeologist that these um, corner towers show a particular style of Irish stone masonry. Um, so that's why you can pick them out as distinctly Irish. Um, and then on the right hand side shows the interior of what became Randall MacDonald's manor house. But in the excavations, the archaeologists found the foundations of an earlier medieval hall, which would have been the hall associated with the Mac Macquillans and where they would have received their guests. Next slide, please. But the Macquillans were subsequently ousted by the MacDonalds in the 1550s. And the MacDonalds come from a Scottish clan, Donald, Lords of the Isles, and their principal seat of power would have been on Isla at Finlagan and Dunnyveg Castle, which of course Isla can be seen from Dunluce Castle. And at that time, um, when most people, the only way you could get around the place was by boat. Um, the boundary between Scotland and Ireland at that time seemed much shorter because you 
people would have been very familiar, crossing it by boat. So the Macdonald Lordship became a maritime lordship across both areas. And over subsequent decades, the Macdonalds basically became the dominant family across most of North Antrim and the Glens. Their power was secured through a substantial land grant from King James, the first of Scotland, who became the King James VI of England in 1568. And then that grant was reinstated in 1603, despite Randall MacDonald joining Hugh O'Neill in rebellion against the Crown. And this is where MacDonald, Randall MacDonald shows his particular talent for astute political manoeuvring. Even though he rebelled, he re was reinstated with his lands um, and secured those lands through subsequent grants as well. And it's really significant that this political manoeuvring is reflected in the architecture of the castle um, as the MacDonalds renegotiate their political and social status. So the castle moves from Gaelic Irish architecture through to Scottish and finally to English forms. And so firstly, we see the move to Scottish architecture, and that's most notable in this um, gatehouse that the, the McDonald's put onto the castle, which is in a very distinctive Scottish style. Now, if we move on to the next slide, the most significant development is this very fine manor house um, in the English, English style, a Jacobean manor house, which within this medieval castle sits really oddly. Um, it looks cramped. It looks like there should be a big sweeping driveway up to it, but there isn't. Um, and Randall even adds a very fancy Italianate loggia um, at the back. And if you just click onto the next bit, it'll show you another detail of that. Um, so he's importing as well very fashionable Mediterranean styles of architecture. Um, again, that loggia is very cramped in the... Um, in the environs of the castle, you would quite normally see that in a large um, open area, particularly in monasteries, and it's designed to shelter you from the sun, which um, isn't very evident at Dunluce either. So, <laughs> um, next slide, please. And Randall's vision for Dunluce as a major seat of power in the early 17th century wasn't limited to within the castle. It was long rumoured um, and generally held to be true within the Macdonald family themselves, who obviously are still with us. They are still the Earls of Antrim and they now resident at Glen Arm. Um, they knew that other remains lay underneath the sod um, under the fields just outside the castle and had actually in their leases to local farmers over generations had made sure that that land was always only to be grazed and not ploughed so that those remains were preserved. So you can see in this illustration um, an artist's impression of what it would have looked like before it was ruined. Um, Randall MacDonald added this large enclosed area which includes stables and a brewery for beer, very important, and um, significant accommodation blocks as well for guests. And outside that you've got some very formal English style gardens as well and there would have been kind of a balcony on the end of those um, accommodation blocks so that you could look out onto the garden and the people parading within it. Um, you can see there below a walled garden at the bottom which seems to be growing vegetables right on the seashore so I'm sure that worked well. Um, but you can really see this architecture as a statement of power and control because what you have is the entrance gate on the right hand side of this picture. Um, all the tenantry is outside of that. You walk into that if you're allowed to, if you're a guest and you're arriving by horse and to arrive in the accommodation. But you have to cross over the bridge and through another gate to get into where the McDonald's are. And then you have to be allowed into the manor house and into the great hall within that in order to be graced with their presence. So it's this very clear kind of statement of you're privileged to enter into here and be part of our family. Um, so next slide, please. Um, you can see here just about what the um, fields look like now and before the excavations. So on the right hand side towards the sea you can see the outlines of those formal gardens and then stretching back towards the road all these little lumps and bumps in the grass which indicate that there is something there. Um, but there had never been an opportunity to investigate these earthworks and nobody was actually really prepared for how well preserved the remnants of what was underneath there was. So next slide, please. 
And this is what was found in those early excavations. You can see how shallow these remains are underneath the sod and how well preserved these are. That is a very substantial cobbled road um, with drainage channels in it um, to the near side and what was the remains of a two-storey stone-built merchant's house, um, which would have been occupied um, by 1614 and included a main living area, a gable fireplace, an internal toilet on the ground floor and sleeping in private quarters contained upstairs and a garden behind. Um, finds included Scottish coinage, early 17th century ceramics and a mid 16th century Polish coin with a hole through it, so it was probably worn as a necklace, um, kept as a souvenir probably from earlier Scottish migrations to Poland. Um, close by, along the same cobbled street, a blacksmith's workshop was excavated and it appears to have been abandoned almost overnight as tools and heaps of horseshoes were found underneath the collapsed walls and it would, had probably been collapsed during the rebellion of 1641. A number of small gaming places for 17th century gaming boards were found just outside the entrance, kind of suggesting that this was a gathering area while you were getting your horse shod to gossip and generally pass the time of day. Um, next slide, please. So the size of these two-storey houses, several of which were found in the excavation, correlate with those depicted on contemporary illustrated maps made by Thomas Raven, which you may have seen before, which were intended to document the progress of the official Ulster plantation, which was obviously happening the other side of the ban and led by the Honourable the Irish Society. Um, so we, Randall MacDonald is building in the same style of houses that are being built in other plantation towns in Coleraine, Londonderry, um, all over County Londonderry as it became. And in fact, it became clear that beneath the modern pebble dash and other modifications, Sean McKinley's farmhouse is one of those houses, possibly the courthouse. So you never know what's underneath the pebble dash. <laughs> Next slide, please. And this is an artist illustration by Philip Armstrong of what we think the entire town would have looked like. And you can see how substantial it is. It is a formally laid out town. Um, by 1611, a report on the work undertaken by the Crown servitors, obviously indicating Macdonald is doing this at the behest of King James, um, described the town as consisting of many tenements after the fashion of the Pale in Dublin, and peopled for the most part with Scotsmen. So of course the Macdonalds had their own st estates in Scotland and it was relatively simple for them to encourage Scottish people, Scottish Protestants to come across and settle this town that he was developing outside Dunluce Castle. And you can see a formalised structure to the town which is very different from late medieval settlements with buildings laid out to a sub-rectangular plan around a wide cobbled marketplace in the centre which then leads down towards the castle entrance. At its highest point at the opposite side to the castle stood a large courthouse which then served as the new central focus for administrative activity. And I've managed to cut it off in this picture, but St Cuthbert's Church is down at the bottom, and that's another important feature of these kind of early modern towns. So you have um, kind of religious administration and power as well as um, financial power represented within it. Next slide, please. So you can see some similarities with what's happening in Coleraine just after what's happening at Dunluce. Dunluce was actually started to be built before Coleraine was um, rebuilt and extended by the Honourable the Irish Society. Some of you will be already familiar with this plan, but you can start to see some of the similarities in it. There's a central marketplace and it's surrounded by streets laid out in a sort of rectangular plan again. The old abbey is repurposed as a manor house, just the way Randall had repurposed the castle as a manor house as well. And there is a place of worship, which we know obviously as St Patrick's now. Um, what we now know is the town hall was added later and similarly to the courthouse at Dunluce would have acted as a marketplace and courthouse at the same time. What differentiates Coleraine crucially is that there is direct access to water, namely the River Ban, which connected Coleraine to valuable local fisheries and offered safe navigation for travellers and traders from further afield. Also important to note is that Dunluce, unlike Coleraine, did not have a defensive enclosure, which indicates that Macdonald perhaps felt more secure on his lands than the Honourable of the Irish Society did on theirs. Next slide, please. And Dunluce, though it was the primary seat of power for the Macdonalds, wasn't the only place where he's creating these settlements. 
There's not as much evidence, obviously, surviving of these because they weren't beautifully preserved underneath a field, um, because these towns still exist. But um, Randall MacDonald was also uh, developing the towns, particularly at Ballycastle, at Dunanini, Bush Mills, Ballymoney, Clock and Glen Arm. And we wouldn't think of any of these as plantation towns now because they don't have necessarily the typical layout or it hasn't been preserved as it would have been in other County Londonderry plantation towns, but also because we don't think of the McDonald's as doing plantation in the same way. Um, but this network directly replicates the government-sponsored plantation across Ulster and Munster. Um, next slide, please. So back to this, just to re-emphasise a couple of things. Um, Although, so although the McDonald's power and influence in this area didn't diminish, because as I said, they're still here um, and they're still based in Glenarm Castle, Dunluce itself proved a folly and the family and everybody else moved away from there. Um, it seems clear that mercantile activity had pretty much stopped by the 1630s, so it only really lasted about 30 years and then a lot of it was destroyed during the 1641 rebellion and it never really survived from then. The family never came back to it and never tried to rebuild it. So it represents the failure of a Gaelic Lord's attempt to hold on to the past. What he was trying to do was situate himself where he knew he had power as a Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic Lord but he was unable to respond to how the future was changing at that site. And the primary reason that Dunluce could never survive and compete with Coleraine is that it never had access to a safe harbour. You can't build a mercantile centre without ships being able to come in and out. And we obviously have a wealth of surviving cartographic and documentary evidence for the official plantation of Ulster. But Mac Randall MacDonald's project east of the Ban is far less visible historically. Um, which makes archaeological research by Dr. Colin Breen in particular very invaluable. Next slide, please. And while these excavations that were going on, that's where I came in. So that kind of coincided with the 400th anniversary of the Charter of Coleraine um, under the plantation. And as a museum service team, we were very aware that the plantation is a contested history. People feel very differently about it. And we wanted to be very proactive about setting a precedent for exploring that history in an inclusive way, acknowledging its full complexity and the multiple perspectives that people have on it in the present. And Colin Brain was very up for a partnership on that, recognised the potential for it himself as well. And so what we did was we brought together community groups, three different community groups from across the Causeway Coast and Glensborough area. Galvin Area Community Association, which is up near Dungibbon, and Bush Mills and Bally Sally groups as well. And we brought them to sites that were immediate to themselves and introduced the people that weren't nearby to it to them as well. So we explored three plantation settlements at Dungibbon and Coleraine and Dunluce, each of which have been explored by archaeologists in the relatively recent past, and that archaeological investigation shed new light on what those places, what had happened there and what it meant. And um, what was unique about the project is that all those groups, those volunteers and participants got to work alongside archaeologists during the excavation at Dunluce. And then they produced a touring exhibition as a result. And that's one of the panels from it on the slide there. Next slide, please. Um, so these slides just go through some of the quotes that we received, the feedback that we received from people about the experience of being part of that excavation. It was something I knew nothing about previously and now I'm interested in finding out more. I think that quote really indicates that um, lots of people were attracted by the idea of getting a chance to do archaeology and that brought to us people who wouldn't necessarily have a natural interest in history or heritage before, um, but that real hands-on engagement with it started, hopefully, a lifelong interest thereafter. Next slide, please. They blew so much out of the water, stories and myths we have accepted as truth, stories we grew up with. Um, this is particularly evident in people who regarded the plantation as a story of English and Scottish people robbing Irish people of land. Um, and just by laying out the evidence that we know from historical records and from archaeology about how it was much more complex than that, really, in reality, on the ground, people were able to start to see that history differently and interpret that evidence for themselves. 
Many came to realise that what they'd been told by their families, members or community leaders, because of course this history isn't taught often in schools, um, that, that what they'd been told wasn't accurate and they wanted to reassess that then for themselves. Next slide, please. Um, this quote really um, illustrates really well how much of an impact the hands-on experiences in the trenches of the excavation had on people. That idea of just uncovering something themselves that hadn't been touched or used for 400 years and they were the next people to touch it really kind of connected them with the people that lived in Dunluce Town and what their lives might have been like. It's a very, very different experience from coming along on a visit to an excavation and watching from outside the tape while an archaeologist talks to you about it. Next slide, please. And then this, it was amazing to see how the site changed because the participants were there from the start of the excavation. They saw how, um, as things were being revealed, archaeologists were developing their own understanding of what it meant and what it was and saw how they were debating between themselves what the evidence meant and how their ideas changed. And I think that was really, really important for people to get that the process of history isn't simply about facts, it's about interpretation of those facts as well, and that ideas about the past change, they are never fixed. Next one. Next one, please, Marilyn. And finally, um, a number of the participants spoke about how the project encouraged them to reassess their own sense of identity and belonging. Obviously, because Dun there is no settlement around Dunluce Castle now, so it can feel very removed from our daily lives, and a lot of people think of it as just for tourists, really, not for us. But that idea that there's Irish, Scottish, and English identity there in the castle means for people that it belongs to everyone. Um, and there's a potential here that in offering people engaging opportunities to take part in a project like this, their sense of belonging to this heritage increases and perhaps they become more enthusiastic advocates for its preservation and public access in the future. Next slide, please. That um, project then led on to a much larger project about the legacy of plantations, which was led by Cormela with Ulster University and Queen's and Causey Coast and Glensburg Council and Belfast. I think it's probably too long to play for tonight, but if there's the link there and we can pass that on in the um, Heritage Newsletter maybe as well so people can look at it later on. Um, that was where we um, invited people from all across Northern Ireland to come and examine the legacies of plantation and the Causeway Coast and it, it, similarly to some of those quotes, gives you an idea of what the impact that was for participants. And final slide just in case anybody wants to get in touch. There's my details. You can find out more. OK, thank you. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Gemma. That was a fascinating insight and really interesting to hear about your work connecting the, the culture uh, and the cultural kind of heritage that we have to the, to the present. Fantastic. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Gemma about anything she's talked about. We have a question at the back. Just one simple one, Gemma. Did you ever have any idea how many people actually resided inside the castle and inside the small double stomachs? Were you ever able to estimate those numbers? No. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. That's, um, that's kind of a question for Colin Breen properly. Um, I would, th there would be a good few hundred, you know, yeah, it's a proper time of that period, so substantial enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, there are lots of tourists that go to uh, visit the site, and I'm wondering, are there leaflets that are, that you pick the history of it, or is there a tour, always a tourist guide there to uh, enlighten people, because they come from all parts of the world, you see them driving out there. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's loads of that. I mean, Ken's going to fill us in more, but yes, there's plenty of resources in the castle. The problem being that a lot of tourists just stop to take a photograph because it looks nice and they don't go inside. But if you go inside, there's tours and all kinds of information there. But Kenneth will tell more about that. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs>
Just stay there, Gemma. Any more questions for Gemma? No. Come chat to me later if you want to, anyway. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gemma. Um, our second speaker this evening is Kenneth Wood. Um, so he's no stranger to us all, um, as his excellent still and video imagery has been a regular feature in our Heritage News emails. Kenneth is a retired history teacher and now a landscape photographer. He is also a fellow director of the Portrush Heritage Group. His link to this part of the world is strong, for his late wife, Shirley, was from Coleraine. He and a friend, George, have their own YouTube channel, Geowood NI, where they promote the beautiful Causeway Coast through their videos. Kenneth believes that the iconic ruins of Dunluce Castle stir the imagina imagination in a way that few other places do. Tales of McQuillans, McDonald's, collapsing kitchens and banshees are well known. In his talk tonight, Kenneth will concentrate on some of the less well-known ones, ranging from bad luck stories to rock and roll albums, book inspirations, and the walked over yet overlooked evidence of first settlement there. I'd like to welcome Kenneth Wood. Good evening, everybody. Um, Originally, a gentleman called Graham was to do this talk. He couldn't do it because he's away. Uh, then I'd ask somebody else to do it. Couldn't do it. Uh, my good friend George, who is the, uh, the partner in crime with me for Geowood NI, uh, who worked at Dunluce for many, many, many years, uh, he was going to do it, but he's leading a tour package over in Europe, so I'm afraid you're stuck with me. Um, <laughs> What are you going to get? Well, it's going to be very different to Gemma's talk. You're going to have potatoes, you're going to have porridge, you're going to have rock and roll albums, you're going to have literature, uh, you're going to have tales of ghosts. Uh, the kitchen I will touch on because John had said it would be remiss of me not to mention something about the kitchens, so we will talk about that. And we'll end up with a little bit about the object to my right here. So, Mervyn, if we can begin. Right, so here you have some of the areas that I'd like to talk about. The myths and the anecdotes. Uh, there's a rock and roll album title at the top there, if you know your rock and roll music. There's a band called Oasis, I believe, who had an album out called Definitely Maybe, which uh, <laughs> sort of uh, escaped me when I uh, put that together. So if you look, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. Now, anecdotes stay with you. I can remember my history teacher at Boston Grammar School in Lincolnshire. His name was Mr. Turpin. He was affectionately known as Tilly Turpin, and he was a real character. He, each lunchtime, he and another teacher would go out from the school, go to the local pub, have a couple of beers, and come back in uh, with their gowns flowing behind them, rather like Batman. Um, and Tilly Turpin was a, a remarkable man. Um, if you misbehaved in his lessons, these were the days when you had an inkwell on the front of the desk with ink in it. And if you did something wrong, he would take the inkwell from your desk, put it on your nose, and you'd have a circle around your nose for the whole of the day. And you didn't wash it off, because when you came back to see him in the evening, if it wasn't there, man, were you in trouble. Um, his influence upon me was quite great and at Boston Grammar School we even had a castle in the grounds of the school which was remarkable and I grew up loving the idea and the concept of castles. Now when I met my late wife she said to me oh yeah these castles are okay wait till you see Dunluce and she was right. Um, if you're coming from Port Ballantrae along the coast road there as it first comes into sight as you come up via Gallows Hill and you see that iconic shape in front of you. It, it never really leaves you. It stays with you. Um, it, it is a tremendous place. We'll have a, a beginning with potatoes. Okay. Right. Now, John Clark, Jack Clark, was born near Ballantoy in 1899, and he lived until 1980. 
and he was a potato seeder who got an OBE for his work with potatoes. And I never knew it, but he actually came up with a variety of potato called a Dunluce potato. Now, I've never had one of those. Has anybody? One person. <laughs> Are they, Mark? <laughs> so, Mark, you're not recommending them. <laughs> So, there's a potato associated with Dunluce. Didn't know a thing about it. Okay, if we move on, Mervid. Bit of literature now. Why do you know this man? And which poem especially, John? The Owl and the Pussycat, yeah. Now, he did a poem, he wrote a limerick about Dunluce. So, if you look there, there was an old man of Dunluce, we went out to sea on a goose. When he'd gone out a mile, he observed with a smile, it's time to return to Dunluce. <laughs> and uh, he actually did the illustrations that went with his poetry. And uh, researching for tonight, I came across this and I thought, yeah, I didn't know that. Stick that in there. Moving. Right. Uh, apart from photography, I have an addiction to music. Um, I have perhaps seven to 8,000 CDs at home. Uh, when my late wife was alive, she banned me from listening, so buying a any new CDs until I'd listened to every one of them. I, I got around that by saying, oh, we've not heard this one in a while, love, have we? When I bring a new one in. Um, and that, at the top left-hand side there, that comes from an iconic album called The Houses of the Holy, which is the fifth album by the rock band Led Zeppelin. The cover of that initially was a psychedelic green tennis court with a, a vibrant yellow tennis ball on it. And yet Jimmy Page, who was the guitarist with Led Zeppelin, said, this won't do, people will think we're on drugs. And so they actually hired a company with Northern Irish connections and they filmed at the Giants Causeway. And they filmed for a week. And if you know anything about photography, the best times of the day to take shots are usually early and late. So the golden hours. And you can imagine what happened for a week. It rained, yeah. <laughs> on day one. It rained on day two. We'll skip through to day eight now, because it's still raining. And the shots they wanted, they didn't really get. Uh, now, they'd hired two child actors, Stefan and Samantha Gates. And they came up with this concept of them crawling naked over the stones at the Giant's Causeway. And that album front cover has those two youngsters crawling on those stones. The inside shot of the album has that of Dunluce Castle. So if, if you uh, go online and have a look, you can see there's that image there. Gary Moore. What does anybody know about Gary Moore? Anything? He was a guitarist from Belfast, sadly now dead. In 1989, he released an album called After the War. And there's an intro and an outro track, both called Dunluce. Both are quite haunting instrumentals. I must admit, I've never seen that film. Never seen it at all. But apparently some of it was filmed at Dunluce Castle. There's something called Rotten Tomatoes, which actually gauges how good films are, from 100% down to lower levels. That's got, I think, 26% <laughs> approval on there, so it's probably not very good. Um, and I can remember my late wife saying to me oh, when we first met, oh yeah, that it's used for filming Dunloo's Castle is. Uh, there's a film called The Fighting Prince of Donegal. And I thought, yeah. And I've looked it up and I can't find any connection with it. Uh, she had a crush on the lead actor in that. So perhaps that swayed her judgment. I don't quite know. So there's cinematography and music associated with Dunloo's. And... Did anybody go to this? Yes. Yeah? What was it like weather-wise? 
Yeah. Absolutely great, wasn't it? Um, the sun shone down, and rather misleadingly, it was labelled Van Morrison at Dunluce. And you know where it was? It was at Macra Cross beforehand. Uh, and I remember going on a Friday evening and truly enjoying it. And Van Morrison, the, the road closed off, and Van Morrison coming in by car along the, the road there, and a helicopter must have landed him, I suppose, at the Royal Court. And uh, there was Chris Barber there and a man called uh, Chris Farlow, and very, very enjoyable evening. And Van Morrison has this knack of leaving gigs early so he can get away before the traffic actually gets busy. And the band plays a, a, a song by them called Gloria, and it goes on and on and on and on, and that gives him the opportunity to get away. Um, but that's a shot in my less than capable uh, photography days of that concert taking place. So was Van Morrison at Dunluce? Sort of. Um, when the concert ended, I remember walking back to Sean McKinley's field where you, you parked your, your car for, I forget how much it was, but the castle was actually lit up that night. Um, so that's the link with that. Okay, Mervyn. Right, Maeve Rowe. Mark Rogers. Do you want to do this or will I do it? Go ahead. You sure? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> right, Maeve Rowe. Um, the northeast tower of Dunluce Castle. The one that Gemma talked about um, in that Irish architecture, the round one. A lot of people mistakenly thought those were Norman towers for many years. Um, she was imprisoned in the Northern Tower because she made the mistake of falling in love with the wrong person. She was supposed to marry Rory Og, but she didn't really have an inclination to do so. She had feelings towards a man called Reginald O'Cahan. Her father wasn't going to have this because the marriage would not be good in terms of cementing the McQuillans. So, Maeve Rowe was locked inside the North East Tower. And if you look at the bars there, that's the view that she would have had. And if you look very carefully at the middle of the bars, right through to the cliff face there, if you know Dunluce and you've looked out, there is actually a very small cave there. And by all accounts, he would go stand at that cave so she could see him. Now, true love can run very smooth and it can make you do very strange things. He actually got her out of the tower and the two of them descended into the mermaid's cave. What happened next, Mark? <laughs> out they went in a small rowing boat. On one of those nights we get along the north coast here when the sea is absolutely raging. The idea being to get to Portrush, the boat overturns and Maeve drowns. Now there are tales in that northeast tower of you can hear her sweeping at night. You can hear her broom along the floor there. Uh, it depends what your imagination's like and what you want to believe. Personally, I think it's the wind coming through. And uh, architecturally, if you know that tower, you know there's a staircase that goes up to the next level? Uh, I think it's open again now. It, yeah. it, it was closed for quite some time. But the third step from the top, as you go up that staircase, is quite significant. So if you're in there again and you're going up, have a look at the third step from the top. It's called a trip step. And the reason for that is those people defending that tower, if they're right backed up to the top of it, the people coming up, concentrating on attempting to capture or kill people above, and you get used to the, the steps going up, that one there is of a different height. And the concept was that person would slip, trip, be killed or fall. There's lots of graffiti in that tower. I couldn't find anything at all to do with Maeve Rowe in there. Um, that, I presume, Belfast, and I don't know, is that more there, John, do you think? Yeah. <laughs> it's possible. Right, also in that tower, if you look at the floor, not many people do, there's that. And that is 
a dungeon door or an oubliette. Now, if it is an oubliette, do you remember your French when you were at school? Or have you, have you forgotten, little canoe there? Have you forgotten it? Oublia is the French word to forget. That is either a dungeon or an oubliette. It can't be opened anymore for health and safety purposes. I, I would like to think it's a, a dungeon rather than an oubliette. Because an oubliette, you simply open the door and you chuck somebody down and you left them. Uh, the worst ones of the oubliettes actually had a spike at the bottom. And people were thrown down, and that's horrendous to think that. Okay, we move on, Mervyn. Now, where all of that excavation work went on, and archaeological digging, a bit further along, there is that stream that shoots over the side of the cliff face and goes down. Now, when I was walking that with a friend, and we were talking about what might have been there, um, he said he thinks that there was a mill there, and that the water powered the mill and you can see that waterfall going over there uh, as far as I know there aren't many photographs of that that's one of them so there was actually a mill there thank you Gemma appreciated okay right you're walking around Dunluce Castle and you, you, you if you've got a guide they're telling you this that and t'other uh, if you're looking yourself you're looking at the booklets that you get there and in the answer to that question when you go in and you pay your money, uh, a bit different to the sixpence from 1928 when people first went in there, um, you are offered a guidebook and it comes in a variety of languages for people from different parts of the world. So you, you do get that. Um, but most people walking around, they would likely walk over that and not think of it as being important at all. It's perhaps the most significant and important feature within the whole of the history of Dunluce Castle. That cover underneath it, oh, French again, is a souterrain. And a souterrain means underground. There is one I, also, I believe, if you go along towards Juniper Hill, there's one actually in part of the, um, the cliff face there. I climbed up to it once but wasn't brave enough to go inside of it. But a souterrain is a hidey hole. Basically, if the place was attacked, you went into there and you covered it over and you hoped that you weren't discovered. Now that one there, John Marshall, who wrote that wonderful book on forgotten places of the North Coast, he talks about it and says that pottery has been found there dating back to 600 AD. And most people simply walk over that souterrain without realising. Now, one of the delights of the staff at Dunluce Castle once a year is that they are required, one of them, to go down there, to clean it for all the muck that's gone down there through the year. So they actually go down and they clear out whatever there is there that shouldn't be there. OK. Right, oh, Mervyn? Oh. <laughs> OK, the kitchen catastrophe. <sighs> we talked about potatoes earlier. Um, there's a tale that I heard recently that this relates to a pudding. And where the collapse takes place is so very far away from the manor house. If you can remember the ground plan that was shown to you earlier, the manor house has next to it a buttery and kitchens. Obvious, really. Those people eating in the manor house would want their food to be as warm as possible. The kitchen, right at the north end of the castle, to bring it all that way, it would it have kept warm? I don't know. Uh, I was told the other day that the one if it was one, towards the north end of the castle, actually was for making the puddings. And that it was the pudding that collapsed into the sea with the, the people there. Um, Hector MacDonald, who is the current uncle of the Earl of Antrim, in his book, A History of Dunluce, he casts a lot of doubt on whether this did occur as such, with the kitchens going into the sea. Um, if you know that section of the castle, 
where there is currently a railing, if you look on the other side, it's not very stable at all. Some years ago, um, when I was there with my friend George, uh, a tourist climbed over to take photographs, and the earth there it really is very insecure. And George had to be very firm in asking um, the person to come back. So if it collapsed or not, I, I leave it entirely up to you. Um, people have different opinions. Mark, what do you think? It was the north section of the the, the Duchess's area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and such. So that there are different versions, but there are drawings of Dunluce in the late 18th, early 19th century, with that section of the castle still in one piece. So I'm not quite sure, but. Um, the, the kitchen collapse really does make a, a very interesting tale, especially if you're a, a guide along the north coast and you want to say, yes, there's Dunluce Castle where the kitchen's collapsed into the sea. People like anecdotes. <laughs> now, the castle did inspire other castles. Uh, the one on the left there and from C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories, what castle would that be? Exactly, Care Parvarel there. And this one here, if you've ever watched Game of Thrones, that inspired, I think it's Castle Greyjoy. And you get tourists who go to Dunluce and they ask, where did Game of Thrones film here? <laughs> and it never did. They took an image of it and using CGI, yeah, yeah created that image for it. Okay. Right, the Girona. Now, a tale that's familiar to most people, the sinking of the Galias the Girona. Many of the early tales about the Girona have it going down in a couple of places. One is off the rocks at Dunluce. The other is at the Rock of Bunboys. And where's that? That's yeah, exactly, the mouth of the river bush at Port Ballantrae. Um, we know where it went down. Robert Stenoui, 1967 and all that stuff. Um, the Girona itself, why did people think it went down at Dunluce? If you look at maps from the period, maps have two locations on them. One is Portrush, one is Dunluce. And it's closer to Dunluce than anywhere. The, the cannons were taken from the wreck and they were actually put into the gatehouse section and the turrets to the side at the southeast tower. Okay. How am I doing for time, John? I'm okay, right. Right. Now, the uh, manor house. Again, something that maybe people don't notice. Above the entrance to the manor house, you have those three faces, three figures. I'm not sure if they're gargoyles. I've heard also that they could be Randall MacDonald, Catherine Manners, and A. N. Other. <laughs> um, but they sit there, and again, most people who look around Dunluce Castle don't look and see those three faces above the entrance to the manor house. Next time you're there, have a little look and see. Right, Sawley Boy and the Porridge Story. Fascinating tale, this, if it's true. Now, Sawley Boy is a, a larger-than-life character, one that uh, we had a delightful talk about here a few years ago, I, I remember. Um, and the motto of Clan MacDonald is... Oh, we're in French again. Toujours prêt always ready and the tale about Sawley Boy and his porridge goes along the following lines that he stirred his porridge with his feet <laughs> so both of his hands were free in case of any danger he could pick up swords and defend himself 
I dread to think what his porridge may have tasted like. Um, if you go to Bally Castle, it is still possible to see a part of Dunanini's wall there, the castle where Solly Boyd died. That there's not much of it left, and it, it, it's not easy to get to. But I've, I've been there and I photographed it, um, and there is a, a very small section of that castle left. Have you been there? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Worthwhile going, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. The, the visitor experience at Dunluce. Okay. One job that uh, the people that work there have to do each morning is to check the grounds of the castle to see what may have occurred overnight. Sometimes they find peculiar things. On occasions they found black candles, um, which <laughs> makes you wonder. Uh, they also found this pair who got a hammock from that rail we talked about at the north end of the castle, slung and attached to the wall. And those two people had actually spent the night in hammocks there, for whatever reason, I don't know. Maybe they were photographers and wanted to get a good shot in the morning. Uh, but if you look at this one here, Do not climb on the building. This is somebody putting themselves at danger, never mind whoever it might be that would have to go and rescue them should they fall. Uh, dreadfully dangerous to do such a thing. Right, the middle shot is a photograph that I took using a fisheye lens. Now, a fisheye lens brings so much more in, and that takes you into the section of the castle um, regarding a, a kind of a bad luck story. Way back in 2002, an American couple turned up at Dunluce half an hour before closing time. They went to the counter and said, is it okay to go in? And they were told, yeah, go ahead. There's nobody else down there. You've got it to yourself, but you have to be out back at the gate for half four. <coughs> down they went. And do you remember those Instamatic cameras from years ago that you bought on holiday? where you pressed and then you got all the, the malarkey afterwards. So, out they come. They turned up again the next day with a photograph. And they handed it to the staff there. And they said, I thought you said there was nobody else in apart from us. There were, wasn't. Well, have a look at this. And the photograph had the image of all that can be described, a kind of a, a Franciscan monk <laughs> in the photograph. And they left a copy with the staff at Dunluce Castle. The staff put it away, and whenever it's been taken out since, there's been something of calamitous has happened. The last occasion that it was taken out, one of the members of staff fell and broke his arm on the cobbles of Dunluce and various other things like that have happened. Now, when I've been up there visiting, I've never dared ask them to take <laughs> the photograph out and show me it. I don't want to see it, no. full stop. <laughs> but, okay. Right, last but not least. Uh, John sent me an email recently that Paul and Claire Ross had sent to him of this delightful chair that is in Holy Trinity in Port Rush that Peter McDowell has kindly let us see this evening. Now, if you look at it, um, I remember in the meeting we had and John's words about this, hold on, that there says the wrong century. Now, I, I don't know, but I, I do know that when... Um, Randall and Catherine left Dunluce. They went to uh, the McNaughton house, Balamagi, and, and they were there, and the McNaughtons left and went to Ben Varden. Uh, now, there's talk of this being after the collapse of the kitchens. Before the collapse, three years before, 
the McNaughton's had been given a lease on Ben Varden, which seems a bit peculiar. Um, and Ben Varden remained in the McNaughton family until it was lost on the turn of a card by half-hanged McNaughton. Uh, and it's passed from the family. Another anecdote, his name was John McNaughton. The McNaughton family have never, ever named another male member of their family, John, since he lost that uh, house on the turn of a card through the gambling. Um, now, the furniture from Dunluce was removed. It ended up in Chester, of all places, um, 1641 with the rebellion and such and the turmoil um, Randall and Catherine went down to, to Dublin uh, Catherine actually died I think in Waterford and she's buried outside of the uh, the walls of that that town possibly because of the outbreak of plague and maybe she caught plague I don't know but the chair may have been part of the stuff that went on its travels around the houses in this part of the world but it has turned up 1905 if memory serves me at holy trinity from what we were told and and this is what we have now okay i'm about out of time <laughs> sorry yeah yeah this is it so anecdotes and myths over i've probably forgotten something uh in all years of teaching, I didn't use notes, much to the uh, chagrin of my head teachers. I don't know what the hell I was doing. Um, but I just prefer to waffle on. Um, <laughs> so if there's anything you want to ask, I'll do my best, best to avoid answering it. <laughs> but if you have any questions, please feel free. I'll sit down quickly then. Thanks very much to uh, Kenneth for that really enlightening talk. Lots of old favourites and along with some new information there. Fantastic.